Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to chat with you today and appreciate you taking the time to explore uh, what's going on in personalized medicine. You know, it's uh, interesting when I think back uh, two decades ago when I joined my first what I'll call real true precision slash personalized medicine effort uh, at Genomic Health and developing a diagnostic. Um, right around the time the human genome had been sequenced. Um, and yet I think about today, we would not have been having this conversation 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. So up front, I just wanna thank you for your initiative um, in bringing this conversation to a great place and a place where I think we can really make a difference and that is Congress and where we can set policies and really begin to see this get into standard of care in the lives of, of all of us. So with that said, um, you know, you've been proactive uh, and highly engaged and part of uh, pulling together the caucus uh, for, for uh, personalized medicine. Can you share with us how that all came about and where your particular interest was in doing it? Yeah, and thank you, Kim, for, for hosting and, uh, you know, just the work that Genomic Health is doing. And, and for me, you know, I, I don't have a scientific background. I was a, I am a son of a cop, a former prosecutor, uh, played college sports. I wasn't exposed much uh, growing up in my formative years, you know, to life sciences and biotech. Uh, but just by nature of growing up in the Bay Area, you know, when I got into uh, public service, you couldn't miss, you know, the number of uh, biotech companies who were seeking to, you know, expand quality, increase quality of care, expand access and, and reduce the cost. And so being in Congress uh, early on in my service, uh, I met uh, a leader in the field uh, in Southern California, Dr. Craig Vintner, mm -hmm. and I could have spent a whole day with him. And I think he kind of ushered me out of his uh, innovation center after, you know, an hour and a half. Uh, I, I was just so fascinated about, you know, what uh, genomics could tell us about uh, our bodies uh, and on the preventive side, on the pharmacology side, uh, on the targeted therapy side uh, that I thought, well, we need more non-scientists in Congress, you know, to understand this. And so sought to create the caucus, uh, work with other colleagues, uh, to recognize that healthcare does not have to be a divisive issue uh, and that the future of healthcare, uh, sure, there's the coverage side, but the future may actually be uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I have to say, uh, I agree with you about healthcare being in some ways a bit of a public service uh, endeavor these days. And uh, just a side note, I am the wife of a retired police lieutenant. So uh, oh, okay. that's okay. my background, background too. Um, yeah, you know, as you think about as we go forward and this initiative, um, when you think about the from the public policy standpoint, um, what do you think are the most important things that can be done around the public policy initiatives that you're all thinking about? I believe first and foremost, you know, investing in technologies through, uh, you know, Medicaid, Medicare uh, coverage uh, that are available to patients so that you can reduce, you know, the diagnostic odysseys that they go on uh, and, you know, be more precise uh, and bring down the cost. That to me seems like an area that uh, has bipartisan consensus. We're all concerned about the rising cost, you know, of healthcare, but when, when you drill down as to like what why does it cost so much? Um, well, it's because it's, it's not so easy to understand, you know, what is ailing somebody. And, and so if you can, you know, have a better idea of, of what is ailing somebody and then be more, as I said, uh, precise in, in the way that you treat it, um, you cut down on the time it takes to treat and, and you cut down on the cost. And, and so that, I think, has bipartisan interest. And, and legislation that I've written uh, would allow uh, any child, anyone up to 18 years old, uh, to, if they're covered by Medicaid, you know, to have access, um, you know, to uh, genomic testing uh, so that, again, you can reduce that diagnostic odyssey uh, that they and their families go on. Yeah, that, that diagnostic odyssey is a, is a real issue. It's one that, you know, payers struggle with. And as we look at even today, the targeted therapeutics, oftentimes, you know, you can say even in the field of cancer, 80% of the time they don't work. And we're now understanding disease at a level that we never have before. And so when I think about, you know, developing products like Genomic Health did and many of the other companies that are involved in the coalition, and then you look at the tool side of it, you know, you look at what ha what's happening in particular in your district with 10x genomics, you know, developing these tools that we're able to see biology in an entirely different way now. And it is so exciting um, to think about what we can do over this ne next decade. But 
we're going to need investment, right? And we need other things to happen in the space. And on that note, I know one area is, are we investing enough with the NIH um, in the tools, in the technology to really make the advancements that are possible? And, and so I think the 30,000 foot level is answer is no. And, and I don't think you can ever invest enough in the National Institutes of Health if you want you know, people to live you know, longer, uh, healthier uh, lives. Uh, and what we have found though, that um, we need to invest in ways that we can keep up with the advancements you know, in technology that are possible in the United States. So you know, there's 75,000 different genetic tests that represent approximately 10,000 unique test types for 4,600 disorders. So we, there's a lot we can learn uh, if we invest you know, in, in the ability to test and then also um, in the ability to interpret. Uh, and so while the cost of testing has dramatically gone down over the last 20 years, as you know, you, you practice uh, in this area, the ability to interpret these tests uh, is, is facing a shortage of genetic counselors. Uh, and so, you know, looking at, you know, how do we incentivize the next generation, you know, Gen Z uh, to think about becoming a genetic counselor? That was certainly something I was never uh, approached with and, and my peers were not approached with, you know, in, in high school and in college, but that is a new emerging field where there is a shortage uh, and there's going to be a great need so that the patients understand uh, just what the heck these tests uh, are finding. Yeah, you're so right on that. Um, and I, every time I'm addressing a group of young people today and they ask me about different careers to go in, that is the first one that comes oh, you know, to my mind because it is so needed. And you know, the way I've always looked at it is this is all just data until we turn it into information. And it's not actionable until we do that. You know, another area that um, we've spent a good bit of time discussing and, and working with folks on is how do we get access broadly to patients and get these sorts of tests and therapeutics reimbursed in our system? And there are some things that, you know, I think need to be looked at and changed and worked on there. Do you have a view on that? I, I do. Uh, and so, again, my hope is that uh, my, my long term goal is that every child at birth, you know, has access, affordable access, you know, to their genetic uh, sequencing. Uh, and, and then for the rest of their life would be able to use that uh, in a preventive way or in a targeted therapy way or, or for any, you know, pharmacology needs uh, that they would have. So that would mean, you know, expanding the coverage under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, also, um, I believe also, as I mentioned on Medicaid, uh, making sure that it's eligible on the FDA side, you know, continuing to have robust funding. So the FDA, you know, is, is able to approve, um, you know, these innovations. So in, in 2008, there were only five personalized medicine approvals from the FDA. Today, there are 250. So they, they've ramped up, but, you know, that is still not keeping pace uh, with the, the inventions I've seen uh, in my district and across the country. So making sure again, that we are able to compete uh, domestically and that we're never losing uh, out to, you know, whether China or, uh, you know, Western Europe or other peer countries uh, that are in this space. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is an area where we are so well positioned to lead. Um, and I love that, you know, together we can do better, even though we're making progress, it's just not ultimately where we, where we can be, you know, uh, just maybe a, a last question and something I always like to ask is, you know, how can we help, you know, what is it that we can do? You've taken this step, um, this wonderful step to, with your colleagues to, to bring this caucus together. What do you need from us? Well, <laughs> I think about my own family and uh, when I talk excitedly about genetic sequencing, I find that um, there's a little bit of fear that people have. Um, it's, there's two types of fears. One fear is, do I really wanna know um, this or is it better to just find out what I have uh, and, and then deal with it? Cause you can understand that some people may not wanna think about or have anxiety knowing that when they reach a certain age, they may have a certain illness. Um, so, you know, overcoming that hurdle, be just one, I think ultimately quality of life is better if you know and can treat or prevent um, than not knowing and then, you know, having the costly uh, and devastating results that come, come along with that. And then there's the fear on, on the privacy side. Uh, and, you know, the legislation that I support uh, is a more targeted form of uh, genetic sequencing rather than just, you know, having 
a whole sequencing approach, uh, you know, but being more targeted uh, so that the patient still, you know, re retains, uh, you know, some privacy about their overall health and, unless it's needed uh, for uh, the diagnostic. And then there's going to be a challenge on the life insurance side of this. Uh, and I've met with life insurance companies, uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, look, their job is to assess risk. And when they write a policy, they have to know as much as they can about the policy holder. And so this could cut two ways. One way would be that uh, people who do have, you know, a marker for something that could be debilitating or uh, life-threatening may not be eligible for life insurance or may have to pay a lot more. The other way to look at it, I think, if we can educate the public, is that you actually uh, should see your policy uh, come down because it's going to be treatable uh, and it's going to be better treated because of how we can treat uh, with what we know about uh, genetic sequencing. So I, I really think just on the public awareness uh, campaigns, you could be a, a big help in, in helping me think about you know, how to talk to my colleagues and my constituents you know, about the two fears. And then on the life insurance side, uh, how to make sure that we don't disincentivize people from wanting to do this uh, because of uh, you know, pocketbook concerns. Mm -hmm. Boy, I, I, I know we're running out of time here, but I would love to, to carry this conversation further. I'm actually involved uh, with a, a, a new company that's looking at this very issue around, you know, could we reach a point where we could provide, I'm gonna call it disease insurance, you know, like the life insurance area, whereby, you know, there's a per member per month sort of payment, either by individuals or, or organizations that they work with. If you get cancer, you've got cancer insurance. If you get heart disease, there's a heart insurance. So I think there's so many possibilities. And, you know, one of the things that the, the Personalized Medicine Coalition is always looking at is where are there innovative and more sophisticated ways to bring down, you know, costs create efficiencies, but it doesn't mean stop investing, right? We might need to just shift resources to different areas. So we could have a, I think we could have a, a two hour discussion on this. I love that. And, and, and Kim, I think the beauty of this issue is that, you know, healthcare is very divisive on coverage. Um, there are, there's, there's the free market folks, you know, don't have a government hand in it. There's the single payer folks who think it should be entirely government. And then there's the camp uh, that I think is a mix between the two of, you know, uh, perhaps uh, you have um, a public option and private insurance, you know, kind of a hybrid. And people in both parties are all over the place on that. But on the issue of personalized medicine, uh, whenever I can talk to a Republican about it, uh, whether it's Tom Emmers, my co-chair, or other Republicans in the caucus, uh, there's no disagreement at all about really leaning in on investing uh, in this area and doing all we can as policymakers to enable you all, uh, you know, to find uh, the innovations and then, you know, treat and seek cures. Yep. Well, that's great. I will uh, uh, let let you go now, and the kids are probably getting off the bus, so uh, time to get into dad mode. And uh, thank you again of for course. Um, the wonderful conversation. I look forward to following up in the future. Great. Thank you, Tim. Right. Take care. Uh -huh.